scientific figures in the development of the proximity fuse, Merle II, Vannevar Bush, Alexander Elliott. Under Dr. Bush's direction, a thousand other scientists and many thousands of workers helped produce one of the war's most effective weapons. Its secret lay in a tiny, rugged radio tube, here compared with a regular tube, which made possible the installation inside these typical proximity fuses of a complete two-way radio set. The fuse itself, containing the radio, the detonating cap, and other devices, is fitted into the nose of a bomb, rocket, or shell. Pictures show how the proximity fuse increased allied power. These bombs are equipped with time fuses, not proximity fuses. Some explode too high, some too low, wasting much of their effectiveness. Now bombs are dropped which have been set to explode on contact. Obviously, they will not destroy shielded targets. They must make direct hits to be fully effective. Here, bombs with delayed action fuses fall. They penetrate far deeper than contact bombs, but their range of destruction is limited. The proximity or variable time fuse is exploded every time at the most effective distance from the target. A radio wave from inside the fuse bounces back from the target and sets off the explosive when the bomb is about 70 feet away from it. In diagram form, a contact bomb explodes like this. A delayed action bomb makes a deep hole, but has little effect on the man in the foxhole or the jeep behind the barrier. But the next bomb bursts in the air. It is equipped with the proximity fuse, called VT. In use against personnel and gun position, it was devastating. In airborne rockets and in anti-aircraft, the fuse produced sensational results. Its first air use was at Iwo Jima. The rocket is fired. The fuse mechanism begins operating, and the radio sends out signals, setting up a zone of sensitivity of more than 3,800 square feet. When the enemy plane comes within this area, the rocket is exploded. and over land and water alike, the proximity fuse spreads explosive fury and produces vast destruction. It shot down 79% of German robot bombs in their last week over London. It shattered Japanese kamikaze suicide attacks. It was one of the most potent single weapons behind United Nations victory on two fronts. And its secret was never discovered by either the Germans or the Japanese. Day 1945, America salutes its Navy. In New York City and in every major United States port, the fleet is on parade. In the Hudson River, 50 fighting ships await inspection by the President of the United States. At Brooklyn Navy Yard, a mighty carrier built for war is ready for its peacetime commissioning. Secretary of the Navy Forrestal arrives for the dedication of the Franklin D. Roosevelt, the late President's widow with him. Lieutenant Commander Franklin D. Roosevelt, Jr. is present. An outboard elevator brings the party up to the flight deck. On the broad deck, 300 feet long, Captain Apollo Suchek accepts his new ship from the Navy Yard Commandant. Place the ship in commission. Aye, sir. Truman, before a crowd of 10,000 spectators, makes the formal dedication. In the commissioning of this ship, the American people are honoring a stalwart hero of this war. To the memory of an American war casualty. into the city where President Truman's eventful day continues. It is his first official visit to New York as president, 
and five million citizens turn out for a warm welcome. Central Park, more than a million people have gathered to hear the chief executive's first formal statement on foreign policy since taking office last April. On this day of tribute to the Navy, Mr. Truman outlines the American position for keeping the peace and calls upon all peace-loving peoples to take the course of history in their hands and mold it in the direction of continued cooperation. We have assured the world time and again, and I repeat it now, that we do not seek for ourselves one inch of territory in any place in the world outside the right to establish necessary basis for our own protection we look for nothing which belongs to any other power the immediate the greatest threat to us is the threat of disillusionment the danger of insidious skepticism a loss of faith in the effectiveness of international cooperation. Such a loss of faith would be dangerous at any time. In an atomic age, it would be nothing short of disastrous. The climax of New York's Navy Day is along the broad historic Hudson where seven miles of men of war ride at anchor and millions of spectators jam the shore. <music> Aboard the USS Missouri, President Truman inspects the great ship named for his home state and sees the plaque marking the spot where Japan signed final surrender. To review the flotilla, the presidential party boards the destroyer Renshaw. Overhead roars the fleet's most deadly striking weapon, 1,200 carrier planes in a battle formation 12 miles long. that helped bring victory for the United Nations. Battleships, cruisers, massive carriers, submarines, transports, destroyers, and armed escorts send forth 21-gun presidential salutes. Navy Day of 1945, the ships are home, a war is won. A Navy of 1,200 fighting craft, 50,000 other vessels and 40,000 planes, and manned by men from every city and town the length and breadth of America. Today, with a world at peace, it represents a continuing guarantee that that peace may endure through the cooperation of all United Nations.